Well, the stream yard does not like my chroma key background at all. Apologize for that. <laughs> no problem. Hello and welcome to Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan, the former WCW and ECW World Tag Team Champion, of course, one of the greatest minds and bookers in the history of the business. And today we have a very special guest, the president, the boss, the only man to ever beat a McMahon, that is including Vince, Jess, and Vince Sr., Mr. Eric Bischoff joins the show. And now, Kevin, I know you had something you wanted to say to yeah. Mr. Bischoff. Yeah, sometimes on these podcasts, people don't give people credit. And I want to say this from the bottom of my heart. If it wasn't for Eric Bischoff, I wouldn't live simultaneously in two houses on the water. One <laughs> as far south as you can go in the Florida Keys. And then when it got too hot in the summer, I ended up going as far north as you can to still be in the United States in the San Juan Islands. I built the largest gym in the history of the Florida Keys. And during the darkest time of my life, Eric stood by me. He's a, besides a, a innovator in wrestling, Eric is a, more than a decent human being. And what Eric says today, he's right. <laughs> so let's go from there. <laughs> well, it was nice of you, nice of you to say, Kevin. And the only thing I regret about everything that you just said is I never got to come and hang out down in the Keys with you. That's the mm. only thing I regret. <laughs> I know. You said your surrogate son, Sonny, down there. I wish you had come. <laughs> <laughs> now i think both of you are such a big part of wcw and like i mentioned uh, eric you're the only guy ever to beat a mcmahon really in wrestling i mean from his grandfather to his father i mean he just the, the domination from mcmahon's for you know, the last multiple multiple many many decades is just crazy so being the president of wcw what was your role and in kevin's role when you guys were there when you know Nitro is booming and, and the NWO is about to start, so what's the creative, you know, force? Like who's like is he? He's the Booker. You're in charge. Are you also doing creative? Like how did that whole thing get rolling? You know, that's what makes sometimes doing the podcast that we all do, you know, and myself mm -hmm. included, so challenging is because, you know, we're going back in time. In in, in my case. You know, the subject you just brought up, what was it like, you know, during the beginning of Nitro or during Nitro? And, you know, the answer is, number one, it constantly changed. There was always, you know, people coming in and out with ideas and opportunities and, and all of us reacting to things that sometimes were out of our control, whether it be injuries to someone or, or contractual disputes. I mean, there's a million moving pieces in, in the world of entertainment and depending on any one of those situations on any given day, you know, Kevin could have been calling the shots and running the ship solo. I could have had more influence maybe on a Wednesday than I did on a Tuesday, you know, but Kevin was really the guy who more often than not, Kevin and I would kind of talk through the bigger picture of what we wanted each episode to achieve overall and probably what we needed to focus on and highlight on. And more often than not, Kevin's job was then to sit down with the rest of the creative team and come up with their ideas on how to execute the bigger vision. And I know that sounds, you know, more co maybe complicated in some ways, but, you know, my, my, especially in the beginning of Nitro, I had zero confidence in my ability to even have any input you know, in, in creative, I avoided creative conversations when I was first, you know, made vice president and then ultimately even president. Um, I, creative was that one area. It was like the mis the mystique. You know, it was like the mad. I knew I knew it was a magic show. I knew that. I didn't believe that it was real voodoo and shit. I believed it was magic. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't really confident in my ability to orchestrate. I knew I wasn't a magician. I just understood that it was magic. So I tended to stay away from conversations that had to do with creating the magic for the most part. Now that changed as time went on and Nitro became, you know, 
kind of a reality and also a gun to the back of my head where I couldn't just elect to delegate. I had to kind of involve myself a little bit more because the format of Nitro was much different than the format of what we had been doing for years and decades prior to that. Going live every week, putting on main event you know, quality matches every week, you know, really looking for ways to to create and 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 uh, heightened surprises and and anticipate all those things were the elements I felt strongly about. I just, unlike Kevin and others on the group, I didn't really know how to execute what I knew I wanted, and that's where Kevin and and in his expertise and background kind of all filled in the gaps, if you will. I had a pretty big picture idea what I wanted. Kevin was able to help, you know, actually make some sense of it. Now, Kevin, you're yeah, booking. I, I, oh, yeah. You can, you can go, Kevin. Yeah. i like to just step in there. His, uh, Eric is downplaying, I think, his role. Eric went out and got everybody that you could possibly get. We'll start with Hulk Hogan. You know, yeah, Hulk was the biggest name in, in wrestling, but he had been off TV for a while. And when you're off TV, you're off TV. People forget about you. And he did do, you know, Thunder in Paradise, but he wasn't wrestling. Eric then went and got a, an announcer, Randy Savage went, uh, Vince threw Randy in the trash can. Eric saw what a lot of people don't see, and it's the most important thing about wrestling. And Eric may say, well, he wasn't sure about uh, putting matches together or angles together, but he knew from the very beginning that this is a talent-driven business. If you got talent, the talent will drive it to the top. And he saw that. So it, it, uh, kudos to him because, look, at before Eric got there, we had a host of others, starting from Jim Hurd to Bill Shaw to Kip Fry to the redheaded kid that used to come down from the North Tower and give, <laughs> give, give his ideas what should be going on. Eric understood that, okay, I know it's a talent-driven business. He had come from the AWA. He had saw that it was talent-driven up there, and they would, in their heyday, they would draw our money. But he also knew, okay, let's get a wrestling people involved in this, not Hollywood writers who are going to give Terry Funk a script and tell Terry Funk after 50 years what to say. So, right. yeah, he and he learned on the fly, and he learned very quickly. And I'm not just saying this. That's a hard to do. There are people in the wrestling business that have been in the wrestling business 30, 40, and 50 years. By osmosis, they should learn something and did it. He, he was a quick study. Well, and thanks, Kevin, again. And, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things that I will, you know, kind of take credit for it was, you know, I had, I had a pretty good creative strategy, but again, I think what Kevin just said, and we're saying the same thing in, in different ways and obviously um, in a, in a positive way, but it's one thing to have a vision. It's another thing to be able to execute it. And I think the addition of Hogan and Savage and going after the talents and Kevin's comments about wrestling being a talent driven business. I mean, let's face it. It still is today. Every form of entertainment yeah. on the face of the fucking earth is a talent-driven business, including the one we're partaking in at this very moment. Yep, We're all here because people know Kevin and know you, John, and know me and want to hear our perspective. We are collectively the talent driving this particular episode. It shouldn't be a secret to anybody. And creatively, or at least competitively, I should say, competitively in 93, 94, 95, it was obvious to me that WCW had to strategically, and this is where I think my input was in, more in, in WCW than probably anywhere else or in any other part of WCW. It wasn't in the booking and the creative that, that went on inside of the, 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 the writer's room necessarily, but kind of a creative strategy and, a, and, and tactical creative moves as opposed to, you know, finishes of matches. That I felt very comfortable in that, you know, my balls were pretty big when it came to making moves like that because I, I knew I was right. 
when it came to sitting down in a room and laying out a match, though, I kind of felt like I was reading Chinese. You know, I was like, I kind of knew what was going on in the room. And, you know, I've been to enough wrestling events and I've produced enough. I kind of, I'm pretty sure I know what you're talking about, but not to the extent where I could go, no, 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 no. I don't like that finish. Let's do this finish instead. I just didn't have those kind of chops. What about when you get Hogan? And, and I know, uh, Kevin, we talked about this very, very recently on the show. Actually, just got released today. You get Hogan, you turn him heel, you create the NWO, literally transforms the business, the biggest turn ever in the history of the business, literally took the business from kind of almost going downhill to going straight uphill. And obviously, you know, we've talked about this a million times. The WWF copied a lot of things. They made the attitude error. But when you guys sit down, you're creating this NWO, who's kind of saying, I know, Eric, you're kind of saying this, this is what I want, but who's saying, okay, we got to turn Hogan heel. <laughs> he needs to be the third man. Who, like, which one of you guys is kind of enforcing that and making sure you have Hall and Nash in place, but you got to get Hogan and you got to get the biggest guy ever in the history of the business to turn heel. Here's another thing that's fascinating. Now, let me, Kevin, let me take this one. And I, with all due respect, sir, but this is so much fun oh. for me. And, and, I was about to say, before you asked me that question, something, I guess you were leading into it, and it, it, it flashed a thought through my mind that I wanted to cover, but this leads, it segues us right into it. We're sitting here now, I don't know, what is it, 23, 24 years later, whatever it is, 25 years later, I can't even remember anymore. Mm -hmm. Two decades or more later. <laughs> right. And, and we're discussing what now we can all look back on and we've we've analyzed it we've talked about it any number of people who were in the same zip code the day that it occurred has chimed in on their input on it yep. um it, it's just it was this thing you know that, that occurred and what's really fun for me now is when we go back and do podcasts like this i'm going to tell you everything i can remember from my perspective what my two eyes saw, what my two eyes or ears heard, what my mouth said, what my heart felt, what my brain, you know, processed. I can take you, I can walk you through all of that. But what's really interesting is Kevin's perspective is completely unique to mine. So Kevin was watching, it's like I'm watching this movie called Getting Hulk Hogan to Turn and Creating the NWL. That's the movie, right? Mm -hmm. and I'm watching this movie. Kevin Sullivan's watching the same movie, but from a completely different angle. And he's seeing things that I'm not seeing. And I'm seeing things that he's not seeing. And it's not just Kevin Sullivan. It's, you know, Hall and Nash. And Hogan has his way of remembering things because he had his own unique perspective that was different than mine. So I'll give you what my, what, what my eyes saw and my ears heard. But keep in mind, it could be completely different than what Kevin experienced in the exact same moments and time frame. So with that being said, for me, getting Hogan, I had tried a year previously to get Hogan to turn heel. I won't tell the whole story because I've told it too many times. People already know it. But I went down to Florida. I was all excited, prepped, ready to go. Got to Hulk's house, big house on the water. You remember the big place, Kevin? Looked like a really, really, really right. cool friend. French mansion, right? I get there. It's two o'clock, one right. o'clock in the afternoon. We go into Hulk's office. He pops a beer. I pop my beer. May have been a starter kit involved. Not sure. We sit down. I'm all fired up. I'm like, oh, Hulk, you got to turn heel. I didn't say it like that, but I'm, I'm giving him my pitch. And I'm a fucking great salesman. When I want to sell something, it's going to get sold 99 times out of 100. And I'm feeling Good. About five or ten minutes into my pitch, I'm getting this. You know that look, Kevin. That yeah. means that means I'm not buying your bullshit. That's what yeah. that means. But Hulk's too nice a guy to say I'm not buying yeah. your bullshit. So instead, he said, instead he said to me, Eric, uh, thanks for coming down. By the way, I flew myself down on my own plane. That's how excited I was. He said, uh, sorry, and I had been here for forty five minutes. My beer was still cold, Kevin. That's how long this took. You've had beer with me. You know how fast I drink beer. My beer was still cold. And he said to me, Eric, it's getting a little late. I got to pick up my kids from school. You'll never understand until you walk a mile in my red and yellow boots. Thanks for coming by. See you later. 
That's the nicest I've ever been thrown out of yeah. somebody's house in my life. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I left. Now, a year later, Scott Hall comes down, does his thing. Boom. Kevin Nash shows up, does his thing. My phone rings. It's Hulk Hogan. He's stuck in a trailer in a mountain somewhere in California doing a movie called Santa with Muscles. And I, he said, brother, I want to, I need to talk to you, but I can't leave the set. Can you come out? Boom. Jump on a plane. L.A. Here I come. Up into the mountains I go. It's 1130 at night. By the time I get to this fucking mountaintop in the middle of nowhere in a forest, and I go to Hulk's dressing room trailer, and I walk in, and there's like four cases of Miller Lite and two boxes of Cuban cigars sitting there. And Hulk's going, welcome, brother. <laughs> and long story short, he wanted to know who the third man was going to be. I didn't want to tell him because I wanted to keep it a secret. We'd been, we'd done really a great job keeping everything a secret up to that point, and I didn't want it to leak out. And I know Hulk. I love Hulk. He's like my brother. He's my best friend. I'd say this to his face. Got to be really careful what you tell him, because sometimes you'll have a bottle of wine or so, and just in sheer enthusiasm and excitement, he'll say something and go, oh, God, I probably shouldn't have said that. So I said, I'm just not going to tell him. And I said, uh, Hulk, uh, when he asked me, who's the, who's the third man? Who's going to be, brother? I said, uh, who do you think it should be? You're looking at him, brother. I went, Whoa. Mm -hmm. Shit, I'm going to get crazy now. <laughs> <laughs> That's my perspective. Beyond that, it turned into herding squirrels. Then it got crazy. But that, that, first, that right. first decision and commitment by Hulk to turn heel took place in a trailer in the middle of a mountain somewhere in Southern California. I have a very similar story. I'll tell you what I remember. And I, I just read a story about uh, Eric. And like you and I, we'll say we went fishing 10 years ago on the Keys. And we're telling the story together. And uh, you think the boat is blue. I think the boat is red. You know what I mean? It's what that we perceive. And every time we tell this story, the story actually changes because our receptors change along with it. But I'll tell you, if you can remember this, but you can, this is so far in the past, it's hard to remember whether it was red or yellow. But I remember the first time you told us it was late at night, we were in your office, it was me, Iron Anderson, and Rick, and you actually took us outside on your little porch there and slid the door shut, because this is how gay Fabe you wanted to be, and you said, I'm being raised Ramon and Diesel and we're going to call them something else, because you had seen that angle in Japan. Am I correct? You saw the angle in Japan? No, that's not true. It's about between companies, am I right? No, but you brought them in. You brought them in, and I remember that you, when Hulk was in Chicago, and he came out in a black outfit, and he had a black cross on, and he had the black headband on. And this is when, before this, I, I think you were on top of it, wanting to turn him heel. They booed him unmercifully, and Gene saved it because he said, what a somber mood this, mood this is tonight in Chicago. You, you did the thing where you went out and sold him to him. I don't know if you remember this. You sent me out to the same place about two weeks later to check, check him out and see if he's still on task. And it was, it was that we went in the mountains and it was all these crazy uh, buildings that were like uh, uh, some kind of cult-like places uh, that people went and gave up all their uh, earthly lines. You set me up. You said, "Hey, if he still uh, wants to do this, you're right. You went out there, sold it to him. I can remember that." I'm Kevin. I'll be honest with you. I'm having a real hard time hearing you, John. Is he breaking up on your end too, or is a, that a, li a little bit? Kevin breaking up just a little bit, but uh, he mentioned the Japan thing. Eric, okay. is that true at all with the Japan thing? It, it's kind of partially true. Um, I didn't see an angle in Japan. 
that that made me think, oh, I'm going to do this with Scott and Kevin. What I had seen in Japan for a period of years, because I had been going to Japan, I think, since about late 93, early 94, and kind of been studying the why. Because if you go back and look at, you know, WCW and WWF at the time, go back and look at their house numbers, they were fucking abysmal. WWF yeah. was not drawing. They were, they were, they were flat. Wrestling in the United States was in, a, was in a very flat period. Now, WWF was doing much better than WCW, do not get me wrong. But the overall business for even WWF at the time was flat. And I, you know, I like all of us who were in the wrestling business, it was so big in the late 80s and early 90s. Now, here we are three years later, it's flat. Why is it flat? Keep in mind. There was a steroid trial going on. WWF took a big hit there. They were distracted by that. Hulk Hogan's character took a big hit during the steroid right. trial. So there was a lot of things that you could attribute to it. And I thought, okay, I get all those things, but there's got to be something else. So I went over to Japan, and right away I noticed, because I wasn't following the storylines in Japan, but what I, because I'd go there for two or three days at a time, I'd go to one of the events and then I would conduct business. It wasn't like I was going to a lot of wrestling shows and, and studying storylines. But what I saw was that the, the Japanese, Japanese, it was really New Japan Pro Wrestling that I was most exposed to, uh, almost exclusively, presented the product in a very real and legitimate way. It didn't have, it, there was, it was still flamboyant and there was, it was still colorful and there was still to the Japanese culture, larger than life characters, but they weren't as cartoonish and, and uh, animated as American wrestling was. And then there was the, you know, the fact that in Japan, kayfabe was a very legit deal. The press in Japan treated professional wrestling like a legitimate sport, so much so that on the, on the day after, on New Year's Day, which is a big wrestling day, traditionally was, probably still is in Japan, you know, on, in the headlines, you know, on the sports page, they would be covering, you know, the, the New Year's Eve event from the Tokyo Dome, like it was a baseball game or a soccer event. So I started noticing those things, and then I would come back, and I was thinking about, okay, how do I do that? How do I, how do I treat the product in a very real way? How do I present it in a way that doesn't feel as cartoonish and animated uh, and is more believable. And that's when, and then, you know, that idea was floating around in my head for probably two years. It was more of a question than it was an idea. I knew what I wanted to do. Like I said at the beginning of this podcast, I just wasn't really sure how to do it. But then when Scott became available, because his previous history with WCW and having left being frustrated and angry because he wasn't treated well, and then going on to becoming a WWE superstar, making a lot of money and you know being pushed and all that. Same thing with Kevin Sullivan. Now, or excuse me, Kevin Nash. Now these guys are coming back to WCW, and even in my mind, is is not so confident as I was in my own creative abilities at the time. I thought to myself, "There here is the premise for a great story." Two guys, disgruntled employees, weren't paid, weren't respected, weren't treated well. It says screw you. Goes to the counter or the other promotion. They come. They go on to become big stars, and now they're coming back for revenge. That was the premise of the story. So it wasn't necessarily based on the angle that I saw in Japan. It was more based on the reality or the presentation of reality that I saw in Japan. And Scott Hall and Kevin Nash just provided the the meat on the bone in terms of a, a basic story premise. Now, Kevin, you like to say this is a WWF takeover. And I know Eric, is, you know, you're saying it, it's a little bit different than that. It's much, much more like X WCW guys come. So Kevin, kind of what's your take on it? Is, is the NWO just a WWF takeover? I can't hear Kevin well, I at mean, all. There you go. There he is. We certainly, Eric certainly played it that way. We played. Hello? Yep, still here, Kev. We, we certainly played it that, you know, what are they doing here? People had seen them on t the WWE TV a couple of years prior to that. And then they down here, and everybody played it like, what are you guys doing here? You're not part of the company. And I think that was the, the 
reason why people assumed that they were from the WWF at the time. Kevin, it's so I don't think, Eric, I brought this up before. It might have worked, but it could have worked the way it did without Hall and Nash. Oh, no, they no, were- no. No, all the pieces came together perfectly. Wow. It was like you, you couldn't have asked for the dominoes. I said you could not have asked you for the dominoes. I can hear you, Kevin. <laughs> no, I love it. And Kevin, if you can hear me, I, I was going to say you're absolutely right in, in your observation of it. And and if it look, I'm, let's just be honest here. It's twenty some odd years later. There's no reason not to be. I intentionally walked such a creative fine line with the way that Scott and Kevin were presented. I clearly was hoping that the audience would somehow arrive to the conclusion that based on what they were seeing, this was a WWF takeover. But what I had to do was as carefully as I could not make that too obvious for two reasons. One is because if the storyline is obvious, nobody's interested in it. If you know what the ending is going to be before you get halfway through the movie, you're probably pretty much going to you know, walk out and leave or you'll just stay for the popcorn. You certainly won't go tell everybody what a great movie it was. But if, if, if I could hook you and keep you and you're not sure where it's going, chances are you're, you're going to buy into the story. That was one reason. I didn't want to be obvious. The other reason was, and I failed at this one, by the way, I didn't want to get sued. Mm, right. But we did. <laughs> yep. and what Kevin is describing, Jerry McDivitt, who was WWF's lawyer at the time, still is, basically said to the federal court and, and copyright and trademark lawsuit that they, they filed against me and, and Turner Broadcasting was that the, the we intentionally misled. And the judge agreed. <laughs> So my effort to walk that very fine line, it's a good thing I wasn't a tightrope walker. <laughs> I'd be dead. <laughs> I fell. And, yep. And Eric, I was deposed in that too. I remember I was deposed in that. And they well, were the great thing, you know, the great thing is we, we drank so much during that period of time that it was very believable when you would just say, fuck, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember. I remember. I had uh, we had got rid of some papers. I mean, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the seven years were up, so they can't get us. But I got rid of some papers where uh, there was marks where I had booked with said razor diesel, and they said to me, "Where are your papers? We want to look at them." I said, "Oh, I do everything my." And he, McDevitt looked at me and he said, in your head. <laughs> I, I blew boogers because I knew he had me, you know what I mean? And then, but Eric, here's the crazy thing about it. It is still the hottest thing 25 years later. It's yeah. amazing. The influence it had on professional wrestling and the thing that gets me is when they try to do it again it can't be done because I don't care how well they do it how much great performers they have it wasn't them against you it actually became you against Vince McMahon and I remember when you used to challenge Vince on pay-per-views the people bought into it and the one thing that always stands out, and I told John this, in Dayton, Ohio, there was a house show, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm watching the matches, and all of a sudden, this huge fight broke out in the stands. One people had a WCW flag, the other one had an NWO flag, and they were beating the shit out of each other. God, those were the good old days. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. This, this is this has gotten to people like what you said. They believed See, it. They checked. The, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Kevin. Disbelief at the door. They checked the willing suspension of disbelief at the door and went in. 
Oh no, they did. Well, they chose side. It's kind of like you know, people are wondering now. At least I'm gonna, you know, I'll just give you my train of thought here. Just this morning, I was thinking about this because I, you know, I listen to news. I listen to Fox. I listen to CNN. I listen. I listen a lot to the BBC because it's a little bit of balance of both, you know. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the ratings. Uh, yeah, everybody in wrestling media now, everybody's analyzing the ratings. They all sound like they un actually understand what any of the implications of all of the data that they regurgitate really is. And the fact is, they really don't. They have access to the data, but they really don't understand how to interpret it or how to make use of it. So I'm looking at people now, and, you know, they're, and I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. Look, I'm, I want everybody to be as freaking hugely successful as possible. However, I'm sitting back and I'm watching people fighting over continually shrinking pieces of pie. Like people brag now when they get close to a million viewers. People throw it. People think the world is going to, you know, come to an end when you know Monday Night Raw was less than two million viewers in prime time over the course of three hours. They think the world is coming to an end, and nobody can understand where the wrestling audience has gone. Where have they gone? They didn't all just leave the planet, right? They didn't right. all die. They're all still, many of them are all still out there, but for, for one reason or another, they have chosen to disengage from the product. I'm going to give you one spe two specific examples. Let's forget about COVID, forget about what's going on in the last six months, because none of it matters. It's all unprecedented. It's just a bunch of raw data floating around in the air, and it's going to take us years to figure out how it's really impacted us. But just look at two data points. SmackDown, when it premiered on Fox last October, did 3.9, almost 3.9 million viewers Wow! on the premiere episode. Guess what? Three weeks later, they were hovering around 2.5. Yep. W w where did those million people go? Why did those million people come, sample the product, and decide, no, I'm going somewhere else for my entertainment dinner. I'd like to know that. Look at AEW. They premiered with almost 1.5 million viewers, head-to-head -head against NXT. Yep. Am I right about that? Did they premiere head-to-head? -head? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. one point, one, roughly 1.5 million viewers. Pre-COVID, they were down under a million. Where do those half million people go? What are they watching? Right. What did they see that didn't satisfy them enough to come back? What did nearly a million people who were watching Fox and in and, and the, the premiere of SmackDown last October, where did that nearly million people, what made them go, hey, I'm going to check this out. Eh, I don't think I like it. I'm not coming back. I want to know that. That's the real question. And I have a hypothesis, a theory, if you will. Mm -hmm. And everybody is hearing it first on your podcast. Love it. You know where it went? It went to the fucking news. Look at the mail demos for Tucker Carlson. You know, the, the, the premium, you know, because everybody's talking demos now. Like, like all of a sudden, this is new information. You right. Know, demos were 20 years ago when I was producing television or 10 years ago when I was producing television. Demos have always been important, but but what's happened now, if you look at all of the top-rated shows at cable, they're all news. And the reason for it, in my opinion, is because the news is better at cutting promos than anybody in the wrestling business on a consistent basis. You're seeing people going at each other over stuff they're passionate about in a very animated, over-the-top, oftentimes edgier and more raw and believe well, more definitely more believable, but edgier and more raw and more combative than anything you see in five hours of primetime wrestling. The promos are better, for God's sake. And, and the news has become wrestling, and wrestling is trying to become news. doesn't work. You need more emotion. News, the news media has figured out they're, they're going to make their money not by informing people and not by making people think 
by presenting two sides of a story. What they're going to do is create emotion and anxiety and hate and anger and reasons for people who are getting paid millions of dollars to go on TV every week and argue different points of views. You got a heel over here, you got a baby face over here. Three, two, one, cut a two minute promo. And they're making money hand over fist where you tune into wrestling and you're watching promos that make you go, oh my God, why am I watching this? That's why all of the audience has shifted from wrestling somewhere else because that's something that they're missing that real believable emotional back and forth isn't happening in wrestling it's happening in news there you True. go good that's point my, that's my theory i i've never heard that theory before but you just made me a believer we have the president is in the wwf hall of fame you have <laughs> baby True. Fame. Heel, you have baby faces and heels. It's like it doesn't matter if some of them are the NWO baby face heels. It's not. It's that we have become. We muzzle tie. I said this the other day. Muzzle tie a red bandana on our head or a blue bandana and be the Crips and the blood. We're never going to get along. But we're so passionate. The other side is wrong, and we're right. They're cutting the best promos of all times. When I see Carlson Tucker, when he rolls that eyes, you want to reach in and choke him. You know what I mean? Or if you see Como, when he does his shit, you want to choke him too. You, Eric, I never thought of that. It is wrestling at its best, much better than promos because the kids today have to go on a script and they have no passion. I'm not, well, not knocking these kids. I'm not knocking the kids. No one's sat down and said to them, we got to get this thing hot and ready to go. And the other thing about news, which you brought up, it's believable. They got us believing that if one side wins and the other side loses, the earth is going to fall off of its axis. So you 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 have people vested interest in watching the news, and I never even thought about how, like you said, how many newscasts are in the top twenty on cable TV. I bet fifteen of them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that, fifteen. Yeah, no, the the vast majority of them. And the key element, though, is when you look at those ratings, and I, I follow news ratings just because it's pop culture, it's part of culture, and I'm always interested in that crap. But when you look at, whether it's Fox or CNN or MSNBC or whatever it is, look at the strength of the 18 to 49-year-old demo. That's the coveted demo that everybody's fighting for. But they're all watching the news. Very few of them are watching wrestling. And if I'm in the, if I'm WWE, Bruce Pritchard, if you hear this podcast, I'm talking to you, my brother. Hmm. And Tony Khan, we don't know each other that well, but if you hear about this, pay attention. You want to do something different. Look at the success. Look, ask yourself, where did my audience go? Tony, you started out with 1.5. Now you're working hard to get to a million. I get it, brother. Where do those half a million people go? How can I get them back? Maybe, maybe you can look at the news and watch how that show is formatted and the way those interviews are conducted and the emotion and the confrontation and all of that. I'm not saying copy the news. Don't get me wrong. People listening to this are going to think, oh, Bishop said copy the news. That's going to be his new idea for a wrestling show. Fuck you. It's not what I'm saying. No. Hmm. What I'm saying is look at some of the elements that is working and allowing cable news to outperform WWE and, and, and AEW in an 18 to 49 year old demo and ask yourself, why is that? Why? It's the most powerful word in the English, in any language. Why? Why is that happening? Why did I lose so much of my audience for my premiere, both the WWE and AEW? Where has that audience gone? Oh, let's look over here. They're all camped out on cable news. Why? Because cable news is more entertaining when it comes to creating emotion than professional wrestling is. Well said. Great point. Uh, I, and I'm, I agree with Eric 100% because when he was just talking now, something hit me. I read uh, when Trump got elected, I read an article in the uh, uh, 
Atlantic Journal that said Don, uh, Donald Trump didn't get elected president. Stone Cold Steve Austin got elected president. <laughs> it was they were saying he was being Stone Cold Steve Austin, and Eric's right. That's just about what he was saying. He was saying drain the swamps, they're all thieves. You know what he used to say to Vince. You know, take this job and shove it. You're absolutely right, Eric. I mean, and the sad thing is, you made a very valid point, and some people are gonna say, "Oh, he's saying they should do wrestling like they do the news." So you can't please a lot of these people who listen to podcasts. That's for sure. Well, I think it's, the thing is it's, it's you long, don't it, understand your. As long as I'm having fun doing it, and we're all having fun doing it. I don't care if I make people happy or not. I know that people listen to my show, have a blast. People over at adfreeshows.com get on and interact with it. We're all having fun. But if I piss some people off along the way, been there, done that. <laughs> so. Yep. You know, speaking of like rate ratings and you know where 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 everybody's going, why do you think that the fans took to the WWF over WCW? I know NWO kind of ran its point at, at a certain point. You know, it was dominant for two years, eighty three weeks. Obviously, like the infamous, very very popular podcast, eighty three weeks talks about that popularity, which is actually probably more than eighty three weeks. It's like a hundred and something weeks of, of just real dominance. But one hundred and four, but who's counting? Yeah, it was. 104 out of 117 wins or something. It's insane the first two years. But where did the where did the audience go? I mean, the ratings were high, everything, but where did everybody go? They went to WWF and 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 Steve Austin, like you just mentioned. But why? What I mean, you had Goldberg, you know, you had the NWO fizzling off, but you had some certain good aspects. Why, you know, did everybody really go to Vince and WWF and the Attitude Era and Steve Austin? Uh, is that for Kevin or me? No, for you. Um I think there's a lot of reasons, or a handful of really important reasons. The rest of them are, they're still important, but not as important. I think the th couple, two or three critical reasons. Number one is the, you know, Nitro, WCW had been dominating, over delivering, changed the business, all the stuff that I like to, you know, tear cartilage, patting myself on the back, you know, talking about. And then they got it. The audience got a little used to it. We satisfied them. They were happy with us, but there wasn't a lot new going on. There was a lot of decent going on. There was some very good going on. There was occasionally some excellent going on, but whatever it was, the the newness of it, you know, the the boats got used to the high tide. Let's put it that way. Whereas over in WWF, yeah. things had been going all the way up until late 1997 when Vince McMahon famously came out and said, we're going to listen to the fans and we're going to change the way we're doing things. Well, that was Vince McMahon. Okay, fuck, they kicked my ass. Now I'm going to do what they're doing, only I'm going to do it better. When In late 97, when Vince recognized finally that he had to change the way he was doing things in order to compete with WCW, he didn't delay, he didn't hesitate, he didn't take small incremental steps. He went real fucking big. He went with Tyson and Austin. Tyson at the time was as hot as he probably had ever been, almost. Um, the Stone Cold Steve Austin thing was mer emerging. When you put that two, when you put those two together, and then you put Steve Austin against the Boss, which was kind of a variation on what we were doing, all of a sudden now in in WWE world, that's huge news. That's a massive shift. Just like turning Hogan was a massive shift for WCW in '96. That was a really big shift. When WWE abandoned their teen and preteen you know, creative psychology and embrace what we were doing in WCW with a more real, more honest, more believable kind of storytelling format. That was huge news to the WWE and huge news in the wrestling world. And a lot of the audience shifted to check it out. I did. I knew when I heard they were going to do it, it was going to kick our ass. Come on, Tyson, Austin, McMahon, come on. And that had a lot to do with it. They took advantage. Well, they didn't take advantage. They strategically re revamped their, their presentation. Yes, it did follow our lead in a lot of ways. Doesn't matter. 
it worked really big. Well, at the same time, while that was going on, I'll just speak for myself. Kevin will have a completely different perspective of this, and, and rightfully so. But for me, while that was going on, in the midst of it, towards the middle of 98 now, early part of 98, we've got this AOL Time Warner, the Time Warner merger going on. It's creating a ton of internal structural changes that, you know, from the, from the business side of the wrestling business, not the creative side, not the wrestling side, not what, on, it's not what, not what happened in a show, but the business of the wrestling business was changing dramatically inside of WCW and became much more difficult to, to manage. All of these things were happening at the same time. In my case, personally, I will admit to losing a lot of my focus when it came to the shows and, and my, my contribution as far as, okay, what's our show? What does it need to be? Where are we at? You know, what, what's a weakness? What's an idea? Kevin, help me out here. Where are we? How can we do this? There was a lot less of me in that process starting in about 98. And I, I could see the handwriting on the wall. So I think it was a combination of WWF waking up, dramatically changing their format, taking a massive risk with Mike Tyson, who, by the way, was a convicted rapist. Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge Mike Tyson fan. I'm talking about let's look at the context of the times. Can you imagine if WWE were to try to do that today? Can you imagine? It would not happen. It would not happen. You would. You uh, might not survive a creative meeting if you were to even bring it up as a suggestion mm -hmm. in today's environment. Uh, but it worked. Uh, it worked back then. So it was a combination of a lot of things. Eric, I can yep. remember and see if uh, I'm right. You had a meeting when all this was going on with AOL and Turner. And the day you came back, you had a different attitude on your head. Was it that you knew we were screwed? Or did they tell you, uh, no matter how good you do, we're not crazy about wrestling? Because... They made it impossible. I remember the first time we were in a production meeting and we were going over a finish and somebody said, well, they were bringing it up a finish and said, well, what if he brings out a foreign object and hits it? And the guy that they sent from AOL says, you can't call it a foreign object. Did you know then we were in deep trouble? I, I guess it, I didn't know for certain because one of the mistakes I made, I made a lot of them, by the way, but one of them that I made early on was I kind of, in a very arrogant way, I knew that I could win almost any argument corporately when it came to a WCW if I stood my ground and fought hard enough, eventually I would end up in front of Ted. Meaning if, if you know, if I, if I wanted to do this right. and somebody over here didn't, somebody in legal didn't want me to do right. it. Somebody in, in finance didn't want me to do it. I, I wouldn't just say, okay, you don't want me to do it. I won't do it. I would, I would fight that all the way through. And that's what helped get us Nitro. That's what helped a lot of things. The, the attitude about fuck it, I'm not going to throw in a towel. I'm just going to keep pushing until I get what I want, or Ted tells me I can't. That was how I approached my my inner battles, if you will, with Turner Broadcasting. And they weren't always battles. Sometimes we just have difference of opinion, and then it have to work its way up the food chain, like corporately things often do. But I thought that I had that Ted card in my back pocket. Little, what I didn't know was that Ted was losing ground. It just what I was. So my attitude in that meeting, Kevin, I know this exactly which one you're talking about. Again, I'm going to put things in context here for a minute. When I came to WCW in 1991, it was a fucking mess. It was a joke. It was, it was an embarrassing joke on so many different levels. Not necessarily what was going on in the ring, but structurally, business-wise, I could tell you horror stories of things that I saw as an announcer and as a talent. And, and how that comp company was robbed by the people that were working for it, right? 
And one of the reasons for that yeah. is because so many people that didn't have any idea what WCW was really all about, having too much influence over it. So then by 1993, 1994, when I finally started getting a little bit more control of it, certainly in 95, and when Bill Shaw made me president of the company, my perspective of things was, great, if you know my business, meaning WCW's business, if you're part of it and you know about it, I'm interested in what you have to say. If you're telling me from the outside of my business how to run my business and you don't even know what night of the week I'm on, got to go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and that attitude, not, that attitude did not serve me well <laughs> because that was by way I, I would never say that well right. I, I would imply it but i wouldn't say it <laughs> but you know when i when i knew or when i did have the ability to fight all the way up until it reached ted turner or threatened to um that 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 strategy was really effective but when Ted was no longer in the position that I thought I was, and I was reaching for a card that was no longer there, it didn't work anymore. And that's when I really knew I was in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, because you were a very strong leader and gave off vibes, I think that whether it was subliminal and the people didn't understand it, when the guy stood up and said, you can't use an international object, I said to myself, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is going to be very difficult. You know what, though, Kevin? Can you, you know, imagine? Because, <laughs> let's face it. No, I was going to say, Kevin, can you – sorry, guys. Can you imagine trying to write wrestling in today's environment? Where everybody no. is sensitive about everything. It's no different. Talk to a stand-up comedian. I have friends of mine that are stand-up comedians. Yeah. They're, they're scared to death right now. Because it used to be, you know, if you went to a stand-up comedy show, I mean, you'd hear the most obscene, politically incorrect kind of things you'd ever hear in your life. But in the environment of a comedy club, it was kind of like almost expected. That's how everybody found their humor, by going to extremes. That's comedy, um, parody, right. satire. All of it is extremes in order to kind of elicit humor and reactions. Wrestling's kind of the same thing in a way. But you talk to a stand-up comedian, they're, they're scared to death because you come out and cut a good joke now, you're going to get cancel cultured. <laughs> True. Right. I saw a big thing, Eric. Uh with that Steve Carroll and the uh, John, I forget his last name, on The Office. You remember the uh, sure. series The Office? Yes. They were talking about redoing it, and they they were on a talk show, and they said, redoing it? Are you crazy? We could never redo it. They had one, they showed a little clip of it when they had uh, 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 Sensitivity Day, where, where they all put up a, a thing it's an American Indian Negro you know what I mean yep <laughs> and gay I mean everybody is so offended now I mean I can't understand I mean <clears throat> how you could even possibly write something and it, it, but that makes any sense because the cancer also cultural but I, what I don't understand, Eric, is they actually want women to wrestle guys now, too. What's How, how does that work? I'm sorry, you know Kev, you broke If they're what was so the sensitive, do they think everybody's evil? Okay, everything's canceled, cultural. We're all everybody. But yet, Impact had a, a woman that was the world heavyweight men's champion. Tessa Blanchard. I don't get that. I mean, do they let something slide? Yeah. Do they let something slide, John? And then everything else, if it doesn't fit into their box, it, it doesn't work. Yeah, pretty much. Eric, how, how would you approach right? How would you approach writing a TV show today? Could you? 
what would you have to do? Would you have to make it more reality based? I I think in order for wrestling to ever get back to where it was, um, I think in some and I'm here we go again. I'm here's my disclaimer to everybody that's gonna you know mischaracterize everything I'm about to say. Now oh, fuck yourself. Hmm. Um, I'm 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 not one of those guys. I won't name names, but I. I love today's product. I love the athleticism in today's product. Kevin, the cruiserweight division that you and I both created together, I think was probably, everybody talks about the NWO being the most significant thing during the mid-90s. I, I think the, the cruiserweight division was right behind it in terms of what we're still seeing to this day and, and the way it affected what we're seeing. But th- that aside, um, if I had to write TV today, I would – not rely so heavily on the holy shit moments. I would not so rely exclusively or apparently exclusively on so much of the athleticism and God forbid I say it work rate. Um, I would not that any of those things are insignificant and not that they should not be important. But what's happened is we put so much emphasis on that part of the presentation that over the last 10 years, especially the quality of the storytelling and the execution of the storytelling has suffered dramatically. Stories pop up now with no reason, no premise, no backstory. There's no journey. There's no stakes. There's nothing real about it. There's nothing that allows me as the viewer to get sucked into it because it just captures my imagination because it's all just there in front of you as a spectacle and it's not engaging you on an emotional level. And the only way I think you can engage the audience on an emotional level now is just like you found, when I say you, I mean the the collective wrestling universe out there that's yeah. doing it for a living. When, when if, if if you were to spend as much time thinking about the quality of the, your story and just basic fundamental storytelling architecture, you don't have to bring in a bunch of writers to do this shit, right? You don't have to bring somebody yeah. in from from Hollywood to do it. If you understand basic storytelling structure, just pace your stories and build your stories with that kind of blueprint in mind and put a little more emphasis on the story and the emotion in the story, just like the news media is doing. They're not giving you the details of a story. They're giving you the emotional trigger points they want you to react to. Same thing can happen in wrestling. Same thing. I'm not saying copy the news. Like I said earlier, I'm saying copy the formula that's the news work and apply it to your product. It's not hard. It's not expensive. It requires some balls. Right. Different, but man, that's what I would do. I would I would put more emphasis. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily pull back on the athleticism, but I would make it make more sense within the context of a story that creates emotion. That's what I would do. I I like the answer. What do you think? I think this answer is right. John, what do you think of his answer? I think it's right yeah. on. Yep, right on. I'm and still, to, today's still, wrestling needs something to change. Well, listen, guys, I hope to do this to you, Kevin. I'll be back anytime you want me to. I, I, I do have some stuff I got to do today. And uh, thank you guys for, for letting me on. And since yep. you both agreed with my perspective on what needs to be in <laughs> wrestling, if either one of you or both of you were to win the Powerball lottery and have a couple hundred million dollars and you want to go have some fun with give me a call awesome <laughs> thank you and of course 83 weeks thank every you. week thank you know uh, the podcast definitely uh enjoying that and of course e bischoff on twitter as well gotta mention yeah. that kevin i gotta run into you we gotta have a beer today brother yeah and thank you very much for everything you did for me eric especially in the toughest times of my life i appreciate it you're a good man right. you guys be well yeah, thank you eric you bet Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now, Kevin, just to throw out some plugs as we're going to wind it down here, follow us on Twitter at Two Man Power Trip and on Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Kevin is on Instagram at Taskmaster Talks. The website is TMPT Empire. You can get some Kevin Sullivan T-shirts on Pro Wrestling Tees. 
Facebook.com, as well as Double Hell T-shirts. There are some awesome shirts on there. So, Kevin, that, that was awesome. Great talk with Eric. So, as kind of an, an ado and, and as we say goodbye, what are some final thoughts on Eric and, and uh, WCW? John. I'd like to say something before we close. Yeah, absolutely. You know who we're talking about wrestling changing? Yep. If anybody... I want some people to go to uh, Crowbar's Twitter account. At WWE Crowbar. His interviews yep. are the best interviews I've seen since Roddy Piper. Wow, high praise. Yeah, so let's give him a plug because the guy's working on it. All right. Awesome. W at WCW Crowbar on the Twitter machine. So uh, that is Crowbar, if you just type in on Twitter. So, Kev, this has been another awesome episode here of Taskmaster Talks. We had the one and only Eric Bischoff join us. So thank you, everyone, for joining us each and every week here on the Creative Control Network. We will see you next week for Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan.